Hello, I'm Melanie Mueller, the Director of the Niels Bohr Library and Archives and Interim Director of the Center for History of Physics at the American Institute of Physics. Welcome to this Lion Starling Trimble Lecture with Dr. John Rudolph entitled Scientific Literacy as Educational Catchphrase in America. There are a few things to be aware of before we begin, as shown on the screen. First, all attendees will be in listen-only mode throughout the lecture. To submit questions to the speaker, please use the Q&A function. If you are having technical difficulties, use the chat feature. And finally, closed captions are available for this lecture. To turn them on, click the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom window. And now, a few remarks from our CEO, Dr. Michael Maloney. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Maloney, Chief Executive Officer of AIP, the American Institute of Physics. Welcome to the Line Starling Trimble History of Science Public Lecture Series. This lecture series is organized by AIP's Center for the History of Physics in order to bring historical perspective to our understanding of science and its interaction with society. The mission of the Center for History of Physics, that is to preserve and make known the history of the physical sciences, guides our support of historical research and writing, the preservation of records and oral histories, and our efforts to engage students, teachers, and the public more broadly. This lecture series aims to highlight the most interesting and challenging ideas emerging from research in the history of the physical sciences. We have a great slate of lectures lined up. I hope you enjoy this lecture and look forward to welcome you back in the future. Next, let me introduce our speaker, Dr. John Rudolph. John Rudolph is a former high school science teacher and distinguished achievement professor of science education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and faculty affiliate in the Department of Educational Policy Studies and the Holt Center for Science and Technology Studies. His books include Scientists in the Classroom, The Cold War Reconstruction of American Science Education, How We Teach Science, What's Changed and Why It Matters, which received the Choice Outstanding Book Award, and the forthcoming Why We Teach Science and Why We Should. He has received awards from the History of Education Society, the American Educational Research Association, and the National Academy of Education. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rudolph. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for attending the talk today. I'm happy to appear before you virtually, and uh, I'd like to say what an honor it is to have been invited to give a talk in the Lion Starling Trimble History of Science lecture series. I'd like to thank Greg for reaching out as director of the Center for the History of Physics at AIP, and Joanna for all the work she's done getting things lined up to this point. She's been fantastic, and hopefully I can hold up my end of the bargain in this arrangement. The topic, as you can see from the, the slide, the first slide here is deals with scientific literacy. Uh, it's one I explore a bit in a chapter of my forthcoming book, Why We Teach Science and Why We Should from Oxford University Press. It'll be released next April in the United States. And it's also the subject of a more extended essay that I'm currently working on, which I hope to have in print soon. And so I'm gonna give this talk as a progress report of sorts on that longer essay. I'd like to begin, though, with a qualification. As everyone knows from the way we typically use the phrase scientific literacy, it's meant to refer at its most basic level to an understanding of science that is useful or would be useful to the average citizen. That is, the citizen should know enough science to be able to deal with the uh, affairs of everyday life, in contrast to knowing science at a level required for someone intending to pursue a career in science or a technical field. Now, most talks about scientific literacy are all about realizing some vision of it, reforming science education to ensure greater scientific literacy or examining how best to measure scientific literacy, levels of scientific literacy, which are invariably low and in need of improvement, or perhaps emphasizing the crucial importance of scientific literacy in our science and technology infused modern society. To be clear, I'm not talking about any of those things today. All of those topics presume the reality and value of scientific literacy as a thing, something to strive for, 
to measure, etc. What I want to do is examine the construct itself to trace its origins and try to understand how it has functioned and does function in our public and political discourse. I'll argue over the course of, of the talk that while the phrase scientific literacy may have had some so social value in particular circumstances in the past, like any idea that's been tried out and tested in practice and scientific literacy has indeed been tried out for a, a good long time now, it seems to have largely failed and therefore I argue should be retired. But let's begin with, with a little history. Since the emergence of mass schooling in the first half of the 19th century, society has struggled with how to fit science into public education. And the challenge has always been how to teach highly specialized disciplinary knowledge to a wide range of students who have little need for detailed theories about how various aspects of the natural world work. Now science gained traction as a school subject initially based on its, the promise of its practical utility. That is, it was thought that knowing facts about the world would be useful in the everyday lives of the students. And to this end, science was taught what many referred to as what many referred to as an information subject. That is, it was all about the facts. And you can see here pages from a 19th century science textbook. This is Steele's 14 Weeks in Natural Philosophy. Uh, he was a prolific author at the time, and this was a, essentially a physics textbook from 1878, and he wrote books like this for the various science disciplines and other topics as well. And you can see the, the information subject aspect of this, the practical value of the science. You have a picture there in the foreground of a high-pressure steam engine. In the background, you have a hydraulic press. And these were examples of science getting things done. But with the professionalization of science in the United States in the late 1800s came more abstract and more esoteric knowledge that was increasingly difficult for students to make use of in their everyday affairs. One commentator in the 1930s, looking back on these early years, noted that it was unfortunate that the formative years of science education were contemporaneous with the tendency of scientists generally to indulge in a spree of specialization. That specialization made its way into textbooks, into science classrooms at this time, and it pushed science further and further from the everyday needs and, and uses of the typical student. And the result was that science taught in schools was found to be a poor fit for the great mass of humanity that have slight need of such special training and technique. Now, one response to this was for scientists and science educators to shift their arguments concerning the value of science education away from the knowledge, the content, sort of this is the, the information subject approach or angle toward scientific process, how science worked. A common claim around the turn of the last century was that having students engage in the process of things like scientific observation, laboratory manipulation, would improve their, what was called their mental discipline. And you can see here, this is, these are pages from the book, The Culture Demanded by Modern Life. Um, and the introduction focuses on this mental discipline aspect of science education. This was in the time of the faculty psychology theory of learning, which held that the mind could be strengthened through exercise like a muscle. And many believed that laboratory work was an ideal way to, to provide that sort of exercise. By the 1920s, that argument had morphed into teaching the process of science, so still focused on process as a means of everyday problem solving for students. And here's a page from a 1930s textbook um, featuring that problem solving approach. Students were taught more specifically at this time, the, the scientific method, the steps of the scientific method. And they were gonna use this, this, these steps to solve their everyday problems. The gentleman in the car in the upper left-hand corner there, I wonder what started that new rattle or the woman hearing the bird song, wondering what species of bird that is. These were the everyday things that they would wonder about and try to solve. Both of these attempts, mental discipline and problem solving were an effort to find 
something less specialized, less abstract, that would justify the widespread teaching of science to the general public. The ability to reason, for instance, or the ability to solve these everyday problems. While each of these goals, scientific method, mental discipline, and so on, had their moment historically, so to speak, they never really made their way into our everyday way of talking about the importance of science teaching. It wasn't until scientific literacy, that phrase appeared on the scene that science education had a true catchphrase, one that could rally the public behind teaching science to the masses in a powerful way. Within science education circles, the notion of scientific literacy, like so many comic book superheroes, has a clear origin story. The way the story is often told is that it was the Soviet launch of Sputnik that gave birth to the idea. As most of you know, on October 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union succeeded in putting the first artificial satellite into orbit around the Earth. In the tense Cold War climate of the time, this sent a shockwave throughout the American public. You can tell here by the all caps headlines in the Chicago Tribune here on that date, reds fire moon into sky, the moon being the Sputnik satellite. The Russians had matched the US with the atomic bomb already in 1949, and by the mid 1950s had matched us again with the more powerful hydrogen bomb so that things were getting tense. Sputnik showed that they now possess ahead of us the advanced rocket technology that could deliver those weapons of mass destruction to the North American continent, which is what created this real panic among the public and military leaders and Congress and political leaders. With our technological superiority no longer unquestioned, science education in the politically unsettled 1950s was made the scapegoat. And this is where you got the origin of the various NSF funded curriculum reform projects and things like that, that I've written about earlier. Um, almost precisely one year later in 1958, the noted Stanford science education professor after the launch of Sputnik, Paul Hurd published the article, Science Literacy, Its Meaning for American Schools. And this was in the, the journal Educational Leadership and this was October, 1958. Sputnik being October 1957. And you can get a sense if you page through this issue of the, the concern and the worry and the Cold War crisis mentality that permeated education, science education in particular at this time, you see articles in here about satellites, rockets, missiles, the moons and missiles, what to do now and so on. So this scientific literacy origin story originating with Sputnik has solidified over time whenever the, the, the topic of scientific literacy has come up, and it's come up frequently, obviously, since this publication, Hurd's article was pointed to again and again as the source of the phrase. And, and you can see that, for example, in 1991, George DeBoer, one of the first um, science education researchers to write seriously about the history of science education, said, he pointed out, he said, Hurd was one of the first people to use the term. Not long after that, another science education researcher wrote in a summary of the concept that the phrase itself, quote, most probably appeared in print for the first time when Paul Hurd used it. That was 2000. And even Paul Hurd himself, before he left us, wrote that events after World War II, quote, led me to write the first article using the phrase scientific literacy as a goal of science education, although he actually used science literacy, but this was 1998. It turns out though, that this commonly accepted account, this story simply isn't true. The herd origin story, despite his own statement to the contrary, is really just a myth. And with large scale digitizing of journal repositories and libraries by outfits like JSTOR and Google, one, can now do a simple little online sleuthing to see when the phrase actually first appeared. And, and that's what I did. And here's a Google Ngram graph of the frequency of the phrase starting in 1940. And the, the actual phrase is covered up by the picture, I think. I'm not sure how it shows up on, on your screen. But you can see that 
uh, this the Google n-grams for those of you who aren't familiar with this 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 shows you the frequency of any word or phrase in all the books that Google has digitized over time going back really quite far but it doesn't really start until the 1940s scientific literacy and it picks up at two points in the 1940s and then in the late 70s and early 80s um, and you can see the two periods of growth here. There's the there's that spot right there where I found the very first reference to scientific literacy in 1945, 13 years before Hurd's article. Um, and the other period of growth begins right around there in the in the late 70s. So the first, let's go to the first use. The first use was made by the physicist and future president of the University of Pennsylvania, Gaylord Harnwell. And he used it in an essay he published in the Review of Scientific Instruments, hardly the most mainstream science journal, but a well-respected journal nonetheless. And in this article, he insisted, this was October 1945, I guess a lot of things happened in October. Um, in this article, he insisted to his readers that, and here's the spot where you see it, the achievement of a broad scientific literacy underlined in yellow is a long range undertaking of the greatest importance. That's the first use of the phrase, 1945. And this wasn't a one-off use. It showed up repeatedly throughout the 1940s. In 1946, the Caltech physicist Lee Dubridge worried that a large majority of the population was scientifically illiterate in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Morris Meister, head of the Bronx High School of Science, the famous Bronx Science, made repeated statements in 1947 and 1948 about the need for the general public to be literate in science, and even called for a scientific literacy yardstick to be developed to measure how well schools were doing in that regard. I thought it was interesting. He didn't call for a meter stick, but it is what it is. And the Saturday Review, a, a mainstream literary uh, publication, even featured an article highlighting books to improve one's scientific literacy by. And so here you go, how to be literate in a scientific age. The use of the phrase then, scientific literacy, it seems was already well established in these pre-heard years. So I can stop there, having corrected a long-standing historical error. But that contribution, finding that scientific literacy actually the use started in 1945 rather than 1958 would amount to little more than, than a bit of trivia, a curiosity only for historians and science education researchers and scholars to appreciate. And it would make for a rather short talk. So let's dig a little more deeply into this earlier period, into the historical context of the 1940s to see what we can learn about where the idea came from and more specifically how it functioned in public discourse over the years. I began poking around newspaper stories from the 1940s and found pretty quickly the likely source of the idea for the phrase. In the summer of 1942, as the country began rounding up recruits for World War II, just after the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th of the previous year, it was found that millions of these recruits were unfit for service because they couldn't read. The shocking numbers of illiterates were splashed across newspaper headlines all around the country repeatedly during the years, the early years of the conflict. And news, and you can see all of these, ignorance deprives the army of 240,000 rejected men to be trained. Army rejects a million because of illiteracy. And news and discussions of the importance of literacy to the war effort filled not just the newspaper, but the entire media landscape at one point the governors of New Jersey and Georgia argued with, with, with one another publicly whose state was more literate than the other, sort of a preview of the red state, blue state dysfunction that we have currently. To give you a sense of the per pervasiveness of the story on, of literacy and illiteracy, one commentator noted in 1943 that hardly a day passes without a newspaper editorial, a magazine article, or a radio speaker presenting some comment on the extent of the problem of illiteracy in our country. The literacy problem prompted military leadership to seek a remedy. They recruited teachers and developed crash courses to teach draftees to read so they could become productive members of 
the modern US fighting force. As you can see in these images on the left, there's teachers, the GI schoolroom, it says in eight weeks, the equivalent of a fourth grade education, just enough to be able to read. And then on the right, some articles from the New York Times making similar points. In the midst of all this concern over the reading skills of the nation's recruits, the scientific research establishment was busy making plans for their post-war transition. From the all-out crash programs that produced radar and the atomic bomb to a government science relationship that would be sustainable for the long term. A key tension that the scientists had to navigate was between the country's need for specialized talent, the scientists and engineers who were viewed as essential to the nation's security, and the necessity of a public that would support the scientists with generous funding and minimal interference in their work. Meeting both these needs, supporting science itself and maintaining public support for supporting science was the focus of the essay Harnwell wrote in 1945. It came in response to legislative debates over the establishment of the National Science Foundation. You can see the title of the article itself is A New Foundation, and that's in reference to that National Science Foundation. NSF, as conceived by these wartime research scientists, was intended to be an institution within the federal government dedicated to nurturing the scientific enterprise. The idea was that it would provide funding primarily for basic research and graduate fellowships for the training of new scientists. That is the identification and training of scientific talent and then putting that talent to work at the frontiers of research. The focus was always on basic research through and through. And the challenge with that, if you're gonna focus on basic research was how to justify spending hundreds of millions of public tax dollars to support a narrow, self-selected elite doing work that might or might not benefit the wider public. This was the subject of a, of a wider debate that took place. This, this debate started in 1945. NSF wasn't officially incorporated until 1950, and there were years of discussions about who was going to control it. And, and this history of that debate has been covered by scholars like Dan Kevlis and Daniel Kleinman, and, and they've explored that in greater depth, and I'm not going to go into that here. But to sell this approach, these scientific leaders felt that a broad public education plan was needed to help the average citizen appreciate the importance of basic research for the ultimate health and safety of the nation. As Harnwell explained it, if we wish to ensure wise and continuing national support of research, we must eventually rely on an electorate which is broadly informed and educated to this policy. To this end, and here's the, the sentence, the achievement of a broad scientific literacy is a long range undertaking of the greatest importance. By casting this educational goal as scientific literacy, Harnwell positioned learning about science as something basic, as something fundamental to civic life. Just as important as it was for soldiers to be able to read and write, Harnwell argued it was equally important for the public to understand and appreciate the place of science in the new post-war world. Framing the science education goal as achieving scientific literacy placed science on equal footing with traditional reading and writing skills. So following this introduction of the notion of scientific literacy with Harnwell's essay in 1945, the battle for public attention between general literacy and scientific literacy heated up. Throughout the 1940s and 50s, the mainstream media churned out reports on the state of public illiteracy across the United States. So this was a, a big focus, began with, with the illiteracy of soldiers and recruits during the war and quickly spread to all different um, individuals and, and contexts across the United States. The initial focus on army recruits gave way to adults in general, 10 million adults found illiterate, to college freshmen, how they weren't well prepared in terms of literacy, and the heightened concerns led to calls even for eradicating illiteracy worldwide. World Drive asked to cut illiteracy, and it was thought that this would even um, enable us to battle communism. That last article on the right says letters, literacy held key to defeating Reds. In 1955, 
Why Johnny Can't Read by Rudolf Flesch shot to the top of the bestseller list, shining a harsh spotlight on the reading troubles among America's school children. And right alongside all of this, scientists work to keep science education in the spotlight as well, with their repeated emphasis on the need for scientific literacy. And you can see all the different uses of it that happened. And this is, again, well before 1958. The launch of Sputnik finally tipped the scales toward science completely, essentially ending the competition between general literacy and scientific literacy. With the palpable fear the Soviet rockets triggered in the public mind, science had won. And Heard's 1958 article on scientific literacy was duly canonized as the source of the phrase. The early 1960s was all about science as the US developed crash educational programs to keep up with the Russians, as I mentioned, those NSF sponsored science curriculum reform projects. Increasingly though, a focus on scientific manpower, that is science teaching to train more scientists eclipsed concerns over scientific literacy for the average citizen. And then public worry over promoting and supporting science itself seemed to just disappear. Political priorities shifted dramatically with the passage of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society programs in the middle of the decade. This focused on civil rights, eradicating poverty, and ensuring the social welfare of the underserved. Counterculture protests against the Vietnam War and militarization of science eroded public support for government-sponsored research. The space race, ended decisively in the United States' favor with the landing of Neil Armstrong on the moon in the summer of 1969, which seemed to put to rest any lingering worries over our technological capabilities. And the economic recession of the early 1970s depressed demand for scientists and engineers, resulting in, in alarmingly high levels of technical unemployment and underemployment. In response to Johnson's new political priorities, schools increasingly focused on the fundamental skills of reading and writing. Promoting general literacy of the masses was in vogue once again. By the mid-1970s, with President Nixon now in office, a new back-to-basic movement took hold. Naturally, the scientists and science educators noticed this. Mostly, they noticed that public funding for scientific research had been sharply curtailed by the Nixon administration. And perhaps more worrisome, science itself was being denigrated culturally. In response to unwelcome advice on natural, national security matters, Nixon declined to award national science medals in 1972. And in 1973, he abolished both the President's Science Advisory Committee and the Office of Science and Technology in the federal government. The historian of science, Dan Kevlis, highlighted the perceived slights, slights he felt were actually unwarranted, as you can see by the title of this article he wrote for the Chicago Tribune in 1979, U.S. scientists should dry their tears. And so he, in this article, he chronicles the, the perceived um, plight of scientists at the time. But this downward trend in funding and public status continued with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. The halcyon days of science education appeared to be over. Both science and science education had fallen from public favor. And just as they did in the 1940s and 50s, science boosters unfurled the banner of scientific literacy to draw the public's attention. This corresponds to that second growth point on the Google Ngram. This time it was part of a two-pronged approach. A renewed support of science and science education, they argued, was essential because first, advances in science would be the path out of the recession. This would be the key to economic growth rather than national security. So there was a shift in the focus there. And second, they claimed that science was a fundamental part of basic education. One couldn't be literate, they argued, without being scientifically literate. Science, in other words, was pitched as one of the basics. In 1983, there was a special issue of the journal Daedalus published devoted to scientific literacy. And by the early 1980s, following the Nation at Risk report, which highlighted the dire state of American public, ed public education at the time, this was a landmark document 
that prompted waves of education reform, not only in science, but in all subjects, tremendous impact. In response to this, the American Association for the Advancement of Science launched Project 2061, a program, a program designed to bring scientific literacy to all Americans. And here's what the second of their publications, Benchmarks for Science Literacy. In both eras, the post-war period and during the anti-science economic malaise of the 1970s and early 80s, the idea of scientific literacy through its association with general literacy, which has always been an unquestioned goal of public education, was used to marshal public support for more and better science teaching in American schools. Advocates, in other words, positioned scientific literacy as a free rider on the longstanding public commitment to literacy in general. But we have to ask, in other words, did it do any more than that? Did it do anything other than draw public attention to the cause of science during times when the public's attention was elsewhere? If we track the meanings of scientific literacy through the years, the malleability of the phrase becomes painfully obvious. And I'll run down the main variations that the country went through. First came scientific literacy to maintain the scientific elite in a democratic political system. As we saw with Harnwell just after the war, scientific literacy then was meant for the average citizen to learn enough about scientists and how they work to appreciate and support the scientific enterprise. The goal wasn't for students to learn a lot of the facts of science or to even learn to do science in some simplified way. It wasn't even to encourage more students to become scientists. It was to understand the culture of science and the conditions under which it would flourish. You can see this goal expressed as well in the 1959 report from the President's Science Advisory Committee, uh, Education for the Age of Science. And in this report, the relevant passage here is a national effort, they wrote, is required to strengthen our scientific and technological efforts in all fields aimed at the advance of knowledge and the enhancement of the general welfare. And here's the key reference to scientific literacy. In a democracy, such an effort can succeed only if it has widespread public understanding and support. This was science education designed to foster public appreciation and respect for expertise, public funding with minimal public interference or control. In other words, science was flush with cash and the goal was to keep it that way. Next came scientific literacy for a critical understanding of science and society. By the early 1970s, no longer was the goal to have the public understand only the rarefied culture of science. Efforts were now needed to temper rising public criticism of science and its social impact, what science seemed to be doing to the world. In a piece he wrote for the American Scientist in 1971, NSF director William McElroy highlighted this goal perfectly. He lamented what a growing segment of the public he lamented that a growing segment of the public saw science, quote, associated with terrible weapons of war, with pollution of air and water, with hazards to health and well being. We need science education, he went on, to begin to, quote, examine the relationships among science, technology, and society. And you can see it here in this 1973 editorial in the journal Science. They said, the editor wrote, today's public is more interested in solving social ills than in science and technology, echoes of Johnson's war on poverty. At the same time, the increasing complexity and intrusiveness of science-based technology have increased the public's expectations of accountability and have sharpened its criticisms. The definition of scientific literacy now included this new element, a recognition of the harmful effects and limitations of the scientific enterprise. Science needed to be humanized, and the NSF at the time launched a science literacy initiative to try to meet that need. During these years, science was losing the public, and the goal was to rehabilitate its image and steer the public back to the golden age of full federal support of scientists and scientific research. Over the years, the definitions of scientific literacy kept expanding. Through the 1980s, scientific literacy meant nearly anything and everything. Science advocates, education reformers, and policymakers continued to voice concerns about science, technology, and society 
And now they threw genetic engineering, toxic weight sites, the whole the ozone layer into the mix. And they worried that the public lacked basic levels of scientific understanding necessary, though rarely specified, for making policy decisions. Some even argued counterintuitively for science literacy for economic development, that is a science education for more scientists and engineers rather than for the general public, which was the polar opposite of what the phrase was invented to accomplish. And here's one of the articles from that topic in the 1983 issue of Daedalus where uh, Herbert Wahlberg writes about scientific literacy for economic productivity. Most recently, we've seen scientific literacy as basic content knowledge. This form of scientific literacy emerged with the growing public focus on national education standards and standardized assessments, which began to gain traction in the early 1970s. The first of the standardized tests to make a splash was the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the NAEP test, commonly referred to as the nation's report card. Results publicized in 1975 highlighted a decline in science scores among all age levels. You can see science achievement, the trend is down. Although the science portion of the NAEP test supposedly measured four main areas, included, including process skills, understanding of the nature of science, most of the test items focused on knowledge of facts and principles. In the late 1970s, public opinion expert John Miller and his colleagues began testing American adults every two years to gauge their general level of scientific literacy. And he developed his assessment with funding from the National Science Foundation. He had a survey um, and it, it measured supposedly understanding of scientific method, knowledge of basic facts, appreciation of science's social impact. These are all the greatest hits of scientific literacy. But by the 1980s, the survey had evolved to consist of essentially a series of true, false, or simple selection questions. Subjects were asked, for example, whether the oxygen we breathe comes from plants, if the center of the earth is very hot, whether electrons are smaller than atoms, and if light travels faster than sound, and so on, among the various questions. The key operational definition of scientific literacy here was the ability of an individual to understand simple scientific facts. As Miller explained it, quote, the scientifically literate should understand scientific vocabulary well enough to follow public debates about issues involving science and technology. The reported levels of scientific literacy from these tests hovered around the five to 7% range, so a really, really low number, and it was widely reported in the press. The US National Science Board, the NSB, featured Miller's scientific literacy work in its 1989 edition of its Science and Engineering Indicators Report. This was the biennial report launched in 1972 during the height of the anti-science years in America. And they've included Miller's surveys in every issue since then. Over the years, this NSB version of scientific literacy based on Miller's survey has remained more or less constant. It meant, quote, knowing basic facts and concepts about science and having an understanding of how science works. But this latter point was measured by only two questions about experimental design and probability. It presented an awfully thin view of what it might mean to be literate in science. Here on the left, you can see the 1989 version of the questions and on the right is the most recent version. I think that's from 20, 2020. Uh, and there's really been very little change in these over the years in these questions, essentially the same set of questions. And they're trying to track these things over time. Then is this definition of scientific literacy might be, the NSB's focus on science literacy is essentially a vocabulary test, was well aligned with the cultural literacy movement led by E.D. Hirsch in the early 1990s. Again, you have general literacy and scientific literacy rising up in tandem. The science version of this was popularized by the physicist James Treffel and his colleague Robert Hayes in their books on the right, Science Matters, Achieving Scientific Literacy. So cultural literacy, again, scientific literacy at the same time. For them, Treffel and Hayes in scientific literacy was just, in their words, quote, a mix of facts, vocabulary, concepts, history, and philosophy. In their view, if you could understand the concepts and terms found in science stories in the news, then you were scientifically literate. Both Hazen and Treffel and the NSB 
were and still are operating within a version of scientific literacy that sees concept familiarity as the minimal threshold for meaningful participation in civic affairs. So how helpful has the idea of scientific literacy been over the years in defining a specific vision of science education above and beyond specifically or simply promoting a general public awareness and support for science teaching? I would say it's been not very helpful at all, I'm afraid. As we've seen, advocates have used the idea as a vague placeholder for a variety of science education learning outcomes since the 1940s, starting out as a way to describe how an informed citizen might come to appreciate the key role of science and scientists in the new post-war scientific age, scientific literacy quickly expanded to include the societal implications of science and technology during a period of declining status. The emergence of scientific literacy measures by Miller and his colleagues, and more recently, the international assessments of science achievement from the likes of TIMS and PISA have effectively hijacked the concept of scientific literacy with something that has reduced it to that which can be tested, which typically ends up assessing the recall of basic facts. Perhaps the most telling in all of this has been the scholarly work that's been done on this topic by scientists and those in the field of science education research. One of the first attempts to make sense of the shape-shifting nature of the scientific literacy construct was made by the physicist Benjamin Shen, a colleague of Gaylord Harnwell's at Penn. In this article he published in 1975, Science Literacy and Public, Un the Public Understanding of Science, he sought to clarify what he saw as the three basic forms of scientific literacy. These were what he called practical scientific literacy, which was knowledge for solving everyday problems, civic scientific literacy, which was all about knowing enough to make decisions in, around science-related social issues, and cultural scientific literacy, which was understanding science as this monumental human achievement. Chen's essay from 1975 seems in many ways to have set the template for almost every publication on the topic since then. In fact, since the 1960s, there have been dozens of scholarly articles seeking to clarify, identify, categorize, and itemize just what the idea of scientific literacy actually means for school science education and the public. You have here, for example, Gable's composite view of scientific literacy in this chart from 1975. Here's another example. Robert's two visions of scientific literacy, each with its own series of subpoints. And De Boer's historical summary of the goals of scientific literacy, which continue on to the next page, and he lists nine, he lists nine in all. In seeking to gain some clarity in all of this, in 1926, or 19, 19, in 2016, sorry, a committee appointed by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine was asked to come up with a consensus view of scientific literacy to figure out once and for all what the phrase actually means. And the definitive conclusion this committee arrived at was there is no clear consensus about which aspects of science literacy are most salient or important. The takeaway from all this, I would argue, is that while the idea of scientific literacy may have been amazingly effective at mobilizing public attention and resources on the problem of public understanding of science. And we've seen that historically, this indeed has been the case far earlier than originally thought, 1945 rather than 1958. At the same time, its very power, its ability to exploit ongoing public concern over more fundamental issues of basic literacy has proven in the end to be a profound liability. The efforts expended by educators, scientists, and policymakers to define just what we mean by scientific literacy have resulted in a paralysis when it comes to moving forward with effective approaches to science teaching in this country. That paralysis in continually identifying all the things that science education might achieve has, in other words, continually distracted us from moving forward with a focused vision of what it could in fact achieve. And in the face of all these 
possible outcomes, the default approach has been to concentrate on a flat, uninspired emphasis on teaching scientific content knowledge, often by rote, resulting in only the barest amount of surface level understanding on the part of students. A result that accomplishes almost nothing at all in the end. If the history of the use of the concept of scientific literacy as a catchphrase teaches us anything, I would argue that it's that a catchphrase is nowhere near a solid enough foundation on which to build a practical philosophy of science education. We would do far better to set it aside finally in favor of getting on with thinking long and hard about what science education can realistically accomplish in this country, in, in any country. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Dr. Rudolph. We will now begin the question and answer period. My name is Joanna Behrman, the public historian at the Center for History of Physics, and I will moderate the question and answer period. As a brief reminder, if you have any questions for the speaker, please submit them to the Q&A feature in Zoom. The chat is reserved for technical difficulties. So I'm so pleased we have some time for some questions. Um, let me start off by asking uh, this one. Who is leading the drive for scientific literacy, scientists at colleges and universities or science teachers in high schools? And if it was science professors at universities, how did the high school science teachers feel about it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, thanks for, for asking that. It, it was mostly the, the leadership, the people who are the science advocates, mostly in universities initially, the people who were uh, concerned about the future of science policy in the 1940s and, and concerned about public support for science generally. Um, and, and as far as how the high school teachers felt about it, I would say that, that it was, um, I mean, they were just happy to have a uh, a slogan, a catchphrase to garner attention to their enterprise, they certainly weren't uh, unhappy about it at all. How do you think scientific literacy might compare to the arguments that people have made for other kinds of basic science education, perhaps without the catchphrase, that you might find in a liberal arts or general education types of curricula? Yeah, I think that um, a lot of work that's done in the liberal arts colleges around general science education for a general audience for the non uh, future scientists is in that same vein of what they're trying to accomplish. I think that uh, the, the visions typically have been uh, focused on the, the internal workings of science, sort of a basic understanding of science, the big themes and ideas, which is, it's a good place to start, certainly. Um, but those emphases have changed over time, too. So I can't, I wouldn't say that there's been a, a specific, stable way that people have thought about it in those contexts. One of our attendees would, I think, like a little preview of your book and asks, is it your conclusion then that we need to focus on why and how to teach science rather than on the term scientific literacy? Yeah, absolutely. I think that when we, when by talking about scientific literacy and worrying about what we mean by scientific literacy, we end up not getting to the specifics, like what exactly are we trying to accomplish? And there's all kinds of things that people believe that science education has the ability to accomplish in different theories or um, ideas about what it is students need to learn and how that'll function in their lives. Like the, the current focus in science standards, the next generation science standards, for example, is to focus on understanding the big ideas of science and the practices of science, but a very internalistic view of of what science is. And it doesn't look at science in a social context, doesn't ask larger questions about the social process of science, why we should trust science. I mean, and, and certainly in this age of misinformation and disinformation uh, and science denialism, we've got all kinds of concerns about that. And just focusing on scientific literacy doesn't get us to the specifics that we need to get to. That was a great question. <laughs> 
Could you perhaps then expand more on the specifics? One of our attendees asks if you could talk a little bit more about the concept of a practical philosophy of science education. I mean, so this this is something I get to in the in the book that I have coming out. Um, what research shows us is that currently most high schools and colleges focus on um, student mastery of scientific content knowledge. And, and you see this in high schools even more so with the expansion of advanced placement course offerings, which are very content heavy. And, and students are able to perform in those settings because they can, they can memorize things. They can um, get the problems right. Uh, they, they soon forget what they've learned and, and they can't do the problems later on, but they can perform for a test. But that level of content learning hasn't been shown to give students the skills that they need in, in everyday life. I mean, it doesn't give them the ability to solve problems, be critical thinkers, evaluate knowledge sources, understand who to trust, uh, even to know the current curriculum doesn't cover things like what is the IPCC? What does the National Institute of Health do? What's the Center for Disease Control? Uh, what's their role? Um, and these are the questions that people are confronted with, with the, with the, uh, the COVID pandemic and, and those sorts of things. And, and we need to move science education toward away from just content learning, uh, I think, and toward more about how science functions in society and where legitimate knowledge comes from and how scientists know what they know, sort of the epistemological context of science. And, and that's something I get into in, in much greater detail in the book. And that's what I, what I, in the introduction to that book, talk about as a practical philosophy of science. That's very interesting. Another attendee says, thanks for the talk. I was wondering if the state motivated goals of continuing to support basic research that fuels defense, economics, and health are still on the table or have those considerations disappeared? Um, or are we still using the template of education that was created in this post-World War II slash Cold War era? Um, there's a lot of things in that question, um, I, which I guess I'd have to ask for a little bit of clarification. But let me just say this, the, the, um, the ideas about the goals of science education in from the immediate post-Cold War period to the present have changed considerably. And I think for the worse, but the advent of, of the, uh, the standards movement and, and standardized assessments, we've changed from a notion of science education that did focus back in the, in the 1950s with these NSF funded curriculum projects on having the public understand what it was science scientists did the the nature of scientific research the nature of inquiry how how sort of the values of science to this very um flat focus on learning science content uh to pass an ap exam to uh, meet some set of standards which are often poorly implemented uh so there's been this a gradual erosion of the sophistication of what the goals of science education have been over the years, I think, and most recently, that's the case. Uh, let me see how much time we have for further questions. Let's do at least one more. Uh, what efforts were made to promote a sense of accessibility in students, especially in underserved communities? Were there discussions about the best way that this could be through lectures or through hand-on experiences, perhaps? Um, yeah, I'm not sure that that I know a lot about those questions of accessibility and how those have changed over time. I know that, that, that currently there's certainly a focus on increasing the diversity in, in the scientific uh, enterprise among scientists and scientific workers. And, and that's fantastic. And the more diverse the, the scientific um, enterprise becomes, the more re responsive and reflective it is to sort of uh, national interests and, and human 
needs. I think that that that's an important thing to think about. That that part of the thinking about scientific literacy or science education is that it's not just about serving science. It's also about uh, developing an understanding among the public that that the public has a voice in what kind of science should get done and, and overseeing science. If they're paying the bills through um, public funding of research, that there should be some accountability to sort of national needs, social needs, and, and those sorts of things. Well, thank you very much for your fascinating talk and the answers to the questions. I'm afraid that's all we have time for, so we'll just conclude with a few short announcements. Thank you very much. Thank you all again for coming to this Trimble Lecture with Dr. John Rudolph. To watch other Trimble Lectures, check out our YouTube channel, AIP History Programs. For updates on future Trimble Lectures, you can follow us on Twitter or subscribe to our email list on our website. We are currently putting together an exciting slate of lectures for 2023, and we will announce the schedule later this fall. We hope that you'll join us again in the coming year.